I would like to uh, welcome first of all our uh, lecturer Larissa Tamilina and uh, all the participants uh, today at the Future of Europe uh, lecture series. Uh, Larissa is an affiliated fellow with us here in IAS Kursek, and uh, uh, I just want to uh, give you, uh, you a hint that if you go on the website uh, at uh, uh, www.ias.hu and you put into the loop uh, Larissa, uh, you will find uh, two essays what she recently published. So uh, it is in a different topic than the today's lecture, but uh, you can uh, get uh, uh, more uh, academic uh, information and paper uh, from uh, Larissa's output. Uh, a short uh, introduction of Larissa. Uh, she was born in Zaporozhye, uh, a city we keep uh, hearing, uh, unfortunately, in recent weeks. Uh, and we all know by now that Europe's largest nuclear power plant is uh, situated there. And uh, she uh, went on with her studies uh, in Odessa, Odessa uh, uh, first in master uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in um, uh, the State University of Odessa, mainly in economics, uh, bachelor in finance and banking in uh, masters, and uh, then stayed on. Uh, uh, teach, uh, stayed on uh, teaching uh, at the university. Uh, afterwards, she wanted to go a little bit more uh, interdisciplinary, and she also made another master uh, uh, in social policy analysis in the uh, Catholic University of Leuven. And uh, uh, afterwards, uh, she continued with PhD studies uh, in economics and social sciences uh, uh, at the Bremen University in Germany. So she has been working in research institutes uh, in Greece, Luxembourg, uh, Germany, at the Zeppelin University, and uh, has a wonderful child. So uh, also uh, in distant <laughs> research and distant learning. <laughs> Uh, you, during this, uh, and we would like to thank uh, Larissa to take uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, give this lecture. I just learned from Larissa that the whole family uh, started to be in coronavirus uh, eight uh, uh, days ago, so she doesn't have a fever anymore, but uh, mm -hmm. it's really uh, a great uh, uh, thing from you that uh, you uh, took this uh, uh, burden, so to say, to share your knowledge with us uh, under these circumstances. So I don't need to read the uh, title. Uh, we have the PPT. I hope everyone sees it and uh, I would like to pass the word to you. Yeah, thank you very much and thank you for inviting me and I'm really grateful to to you for giving me this opportunity to present uh, the results of my most recent research. So today we are going to talk about uh, uh, about social trust, the patterns of social trust creation and uh, formation in two countries, in Ukraine and Russia. And I think that this combination of Ukraine and Russia popped up too often yeah, in front of you on your TV screens in the last months. But I want to uh, somehow go away from these uh, political views and political discussions and the whole issue. I want you to focus, uh, to take only a scientific focus it, and to take these two countries, Ukraine and Russia, and let's say this um, conflict that uh, takes very wide dimensions at the moment as a possibility to understand that these conflicts can bring, can question, first of all, the existing theories, and they also provide an opportunity to, for re-evaluation of, uh, let's say, uh, existing dogmas, dogmas and for introduction of new explanations for the phenomena which we believed we could understand and we could explain in a perfect way. So, first of all, why would I focus on social trust? Why would I focus on Ukraine and Russia? And I should say that this idea to uh, to conduct this research was 
um, let's say, implanted into my mind by Putin's words, who declared more than one year ago that Ukraine existed as a part of Russia for so many uh, centuries. For so many, I did something wrong. I said I did something wrong. You can see it. Okay, I continue. Eh? So, and it uh, popped up in my mind that uh, Putin's assertion, as he said, that because Ukraine existed as a part of Russia for so many centuries, um, and hence, due to these Ukrainians had the same cultural values, and uh, they spoke the same language, and they had the same religion, they are alike to Russians culturally, and there's no opportunity that Ukraine could potentially develop its own culture. So what uh, struck me most of all, it's not even reference of Kremlin to my country, it's a reference, it's the, this narrow um, uh, approach to culture that he actually said that we couldn't have our own culture as Ukrainians because we were speaking the same language and because they had the same religion. So I, I started to ask myself, is it true? Is it true that the same religion and the same language, they can, uh, let's say, they can guarantee that countries who have the same religion and the same language, they are identical in terms of their culture, in terms of their cultural beliefs and hence behavioral norms. So I focused on this and um, let's say that um, the question of similarity between Ukraine and Russia, it's not something new. Even right now, I have to confront a lot of my colleagues who said, but you are the same. You are the same. And it's recognized, even if they deny the fact that it's, uh, let's say, uh, the similarity in culture, similarity in language, similarity in uh, values, they should, uh, they justify to some extent the invasion. They don't say that. But they say that you are similar and hence you are culturally similar and you can somehow coexist. Yeah, I must say, we are similar, but let's question this interesting insertion and look at it from a different perspective. And I want to uh, analyze this very narrow issue by limiting the culture to one aspect, to social trust. Social trust, I must say, it's very interesting concept. It's very interesting for many reasons. First of all, social trust has a double nature of creation. Double nature of creation, it means that apart from values that people hold, right, that influence how we trust other individuals, social trust is also able to be, uh, uh, to, to be corrected. The level of trust actually can be corrected depending on um, our personal experiences and depending on the experiences in the context of the country. And hence, what we can do, we can put together in one model, in one analytical framework, both groups of determinants. On the one hand, the common cultural values with Russia, and on the other hand, uh, the, uh, the experience that Ukrainians got as a result of independence, and to see what is more important for social trust, whether it's the first group or the second group. On the other hand, uh, the uh, importance of social trust can be justified just let's say, the use of social trust or the use of the framework of social trust formation for the analysis of culture can be justified by the importance of social trust as such. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of studies which say that social trust plays the foundation for a democratic society, for democratic behavior, that for sustainability of solid formal settings in a country, independent on whether they are democratic or not in general. And they also, social trust as such is important for enforcing cooperation between individuals in society, because it's like glue, which puts together many individuals and make out of them a single unity, which is called society. And uh, um, drawn upon this, what I said, so what we are doing now, actually what I, I did and I want to present you, there is social trust, there are two groups of uh, determinants. It's uh, uh, cultural determinants. First of all, out of its cultural determinants, I distinguish between linguistic affinity and I distinguish between uh, religion, uh, relig religious uh, affiliation. And apart from these cultural determinants, 
inside this trust, there is also contextual variables, which result from the experience of individuals with the context of the country or with other individuals within this particular context. And I try to see whether these uh, whether the effect of this true group of determinants is the same between Ukraine and Russia. Are they important for the trust creation and preservance of trust in the society in Ukraine and in Russia? And if they are important, whether this impact, the impact of these variables is identical for two countries. If this is the case, when we can say, yeah, Ukraine and Russia are identical because they have the same language, they have the same religion, and because uh, due to their shared past, and hence we can say that, uh, yeah, they are culturally identical. And let's start from the simplest uh, introduction to the theory of social transformation, which to some extent I already uh, highlighted to you. So, so what's the trust? The definition of trust is multiple. There are also a lot of studies which uh, try to provide, uh, to conceptualize uh, what trust is, but um, we will keep it very simple. Trust is a uh, confidence that I have in strangers. So it's a confidence that the other individuals gave me a promise, will keep this promise. And as such, trust, sorry, trust the fa factors which determine trust levels, they, uh, 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 the factors that determine uh, trust formation can be grouped into two variables, into two, uh, uh, sorry, the factors that uh, determine trust can be grouped into two approaches. The first one is dispositional, and the second one is experiential, experiential or contextual, it's the same. So dispositional, uh, dispositional approach regards trust as a faith. It's internal attribute that people possess. It's part of the character, like optimism, like um, any other uh, feature of character. It's, uh, let's say, when we start trusting others, it's like leap of faith. We display, uh, we display some trust because it's inside us and we just display it because it internally exists there. And um, mm, this uh, leap of faith is not even based on any um, conscious process, it's rather subconscious and it's not, uh, it's not cognitive. And it's believed that uh, the ability to trust, yeah, this, the level of faith that we possess, it's, uh, uh, let's say it's, uh, 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 it's transmitted from the previous generation to the next. It's transmitted through uh, genetics. It's, uh, or it can be also psychological, a result of psychological situation in the family. So children learn from their parents whether to trust to them or not. Uh, by observing how parents behave or by learning in which particular situation uh, we should display trust or in which particular situation we shouldn't do so. Another approach to, uh, yeah, another dispositional approach says that uh, we should regard trust uh, by, observing, uh, by observing ourselves. So uh, this disposition is actually, dispositional mechanism is based on analyzing ourselves uh, or no, sorry, on analyzing other individuals through oneself. And this analysis is usually based on uh, either on regarding social status of the individual or a social position. So if I observe the individual and I see that he comes to the same social class, I, uh, through, by understanding how I would be if I come from the same class also, I can uh, approximately uh, make uh, in my head uh, image of what I can expect from that person. And the same thing uh, can be also, let's say, extended, the same mechanism can be extended also to the um, identity mechanism. So I try to understand where I be belong as uh, an individual in this particular social group. And then I try to juxtapose other people with, uh, with this group and with myself and understand what I can, what is the mechanism what is possible, uh, what kind of possible expectations I can make regarding that person, given that I come from that particular uh, identity group and he comes from, let's say, either from the same or from the other identity group. And there is also a contextual approach to trust. Contextual approach, ah, yeah, I forgot to tell you that uh, drawing about this, so what are the main factors, dispositional factors that define social trust levels? And we can say it's religion, right? It's religiosity, it's level of optimism, it's our psychological conditions, our social identity, and so on and so forth. 
Now we have the second approach, which is contextual approach. Here, the mechanism is a bit different. So the main idea is that we have some faith inside us, right, towards other people. But the final level of trust will depend on the situation, on, on the concrete distinct situation in which this faith will be displayed. So we just don't go automatically with what we have, uh, what uh, with the level of um, trust we have inside ourselves. We analyze all pros and cons which exist in the context and try to understand whether it's worth displaying this faith or not, or whether it's worth displaying high level of trust to go beyond the faith. And in this case, uh, the, uh, uh, the mechanism of trust formation becomes no longer, no longer subconscious yeah. mechanism, but it is very much conscious and based on the cognitive process. In discussing the features of the context that may be potentially important for trust, um, the studies usually start uh, analysis from institutions, from the formal setting. So the country should have very strong state and let's say not even strong, just state, good formal institutions who would allow to punish those who deviate from the uh, promises made uh, and hence enforce, co enforce contract agreements or in other words, promises uh, which, has been, which were made uh, to this particular individual. Um, in addition to institutions, there is also a lot of discussion about equality among individuals when displaying trust. So it can be income inequality, it can be linguistic inequality, it can be ethnic inequality. If people are different, whether they are coming from different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds or they come from different, let's say, from some minority group, right, or some speak other languages, it create, it, uh, it, it's, it, it may create this balance between individuals and hence trust cannot emerge. And um, lastly, they say about security that in order for the individual to display some trust, he, uh, this individual needs to be secure, needs to feel secure. And it's security in the neighborhood, basic notion of security, as they say. And apart from that, it's also the existence of wars and conflicts in the country. And the interesting thing here is that the ultimate effect of the war or the, a conflict in the country will depend on uh, whether these uh, wars um, are ethnic or they are civil wars. So ethnic wars are believed to unite the population through the discourse uh, about the common aggressor and civil war, they are believed to destroy trust because they lack this discourse on, the, on, on common aggression which would bond individuals within a society and at the same time, they are associated with, let's say, with a lot of disruption, disruptions and uh, destructions and so on and so forth. So given this, as I said before, we are trying to do, we are trying, first of all, to uh, position these two groups of determinants, dispositional and experiential or contextual, it's the same, in the same model of social trust and to see which determinants are more important for which country. And if the same determinants are important for both countries, then we try to analyze whether this effect is identical or not. I start with data and methods. Of course, since I, I like so much statistics, I prepared statistical analysis. I believe that just by observing descriptive statistics, the statistic, it's impossible to conclude um, and derive uh, the true effect that one variable conducts on some social or political or economic phenomenon uh, without controlling for, let's say, other changes that happen in all these three dimensions of the state. So I will use the World Value Survey. I will use two most recent rounds. Uh, the first round comes from 2011 because it is the year, the pre-war, pre-conflict year. Uh, the conflict, um, I consider the conflict, uh, let's say the conflict, the first invasion of Russia 2014 in the east of Ukraine. So, and I take also the seventh wave, the most recent which exists. This wave was conducted in 2017 in Russia and a bit later, 2020 in Ukraine. And about 1,000 cases are used for each country. Uh, to operationalize whether people are trusting or not, I use a very simple question. It asks people, would you say that most people can be trusting? If you say yes, I assign value of one and say that this person has trust in attitude. If no, I assign zero and I say that this person is not trusting. And the independent variables, the variables which will 
enter the model will be grouped into three uh, three groups. It's dispositional, experiential, and conventional social demographic determinants. So dispositional, just to go fast, dispositional uh, include uh, level of religiosity, it's frequency of church attendance, religion types, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, or other religions combined in one group, and athletes are used as a reference uh, category. So I compare everything to athletes. Health condition, it's happiness, whether individuals are happy or not. It's also um, ethnic and language identity. So which language I speak, Ukrainian, Russian, or other, and identity, whether uh, I feel it's not something, let's say it's not based on the passport of the individuals. It's how I feel. It's my it's subjective identity, whether I feel to belong to, uh, let's say to, uh, Russian ethnos, to the Russian ethnos, to Ukrainian ethnos, or to the other. And experiential uh, uh, variables uh, also quite long. So we have evaluation of democracy. Respondents are asked, how would you grade on a 10 point scale the quality of democracy in your country? Importance of democracy, the respondents will ask whether you think that it's important for your country to have democracy as a form of governance or not. So answer one, yes or not disagree. Importance of free elections to choose the leader of the country. Afterwards, income inequality. So respondents need to choose income should be made more equal or we need larger income differences as incentives. Perceived level of security, whether individuals feel secure or not secure in their community. War variable, it's, um, I would say it's binary variable which separates the 2011, yeah? So a six way of World Bill Reserve from the late seventh uh, wave of 2020 for Ukraine, 2017 uh, for Russia. And trust in the government. Uh, the questioner just asked, is it, do you, do you have confidence in the government of your country? And respondents need to choose whether I have great or quite confident. I feel great, uh, I feel quite confident about my country. One or zero, little or no confidence. And I include also respondents' migration background, age, and region of residence, because it's uh, quite a lot of discussion regarding where individuals belong, whether to east of Ukraine, south of Ukraine, Kiev. And it seems because of this historical influence of Russia on the border areas, they, let's say, created a lot of discussion in, um, in the analysis of uh, uh, of the variation of various social, economic, and political preferences across uh, Ukrainian regions. So I introduced also this uh, particular element. I must say, I, I will not focus a lot on the methodological parts because I think you will understand better from the tables directly. I will use logistic regression by calculating the average marginal effects. It's very easy. It's much easier than it sounds. And I will, just, uh, uh, I will explain how to read it a bit later. So now descriptive analysis. Here, if you remember, there was a question, question about social trust. The answer, yes, I trust, or no, we shouldn't trust other individuals. So I calculate the percentage of people who declared that you should trust other individuals, which actually should reflect the percentage of trust in individuals in society. And you can see here is Ukraine, yeah, about 30% of people declared. It's quite nice number. It places Ukraine somewhere between liberal economies like England, like Ireland, and between Central and Eastern Europe, mostly Central Europe. It's quite high numbers. And if you say, if you check Russia, it's a bit behind, around 20, uh, just a second, uh, here it is. It's around 24%. Uh, Lucas, just a second, Lucas. Uh, no, I apologize, Childish. some uh, flies, uh, <laughs> flies uh, chasing him. So if you see it, uh, Russia is also uh, is characterized by quite high levels of trust. The interesting thing is, however, that this level of trust was not uh, in Russia, was not so stable over the period of transition, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union. If you see, um, immediately after the collapse, before the whole crisis, economic crisis started, it was quite high to almost 40%. In Ukraine, I didn't, I don't have data uh, for that uh, period because uh, Ukraine didn't participate in that wave. But afterwards, trust in Russia dropped significantly. In Ukraine, 
they were lower levels of trust, but it was more or less, uh, let's say, stable, around 30%, 27, 30%. That's um, one of the most significant uh, things that you can say at the moment. Afterwards, what I did, so we know everything about trust, right? That it's, let's say, average level of trust um, in comparison to European countries, whether EU members or uh, whether to former Soviet republics. We also know that trust in Ukraine is remaining more or less stable, while in other countries, uh, while in Russia, trust tended to fluctuate over the, in the last period since the moment um, of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now let's see how our key determinants, also um, how Ukraine and uh, Russia score on the key determinant, determinants that we select. This is this dispositional, contextual variables, which are supposed to enter the model of social trust. Always the analysis of Ukraine and Russia starts, uh, begins uh, with the same approach. Everyone compares that we have the same religion, as I said before, which was uh, very important, the same religion, the same language, uh, and uh, the same religiosity levels. And it's true. If you, see, if you check uh, this data, it's, it's very much true that the majority of the population in both countries, they adhere to the Orthodox religious denomination, Ukraine is slightly, uh, uh, the percentage of people slightly ahead, but I, I don't think it's very significant. We have very similar level of religiosity. And uh, uh, interesting is also that around 50% of the population in Ukraine continues speaking, continue speaking Russian at home, to communicate at home inside their family. That it means that they perceive Russian as their own uh, native language. Also, the interesting thing that Around 9% of people, if you combine data for 6th and 7th uh, wave of World Value Survey, they declared that they feel, uh, they, feel, uh, they feel Russians in Ukraine. So they belong to the Russian ethnos. While in Russia, the society was more homogeneous. If you see this uh, mauve or dark blue lines, uh, they go almost 90%. So uh, the society was end linguistically and ethnically more homogeneous. They identified themselves as. Uh, Russian. Uh, the same similarities we can also find uh, regarding other, many other uh, data. It's income inequality, democracy evaluation. So the citizens in both countries, we, they assign the same value to their happiness levels, to their democracy evaluation, to their, in, to their income inequality in the country, to um, their health condition in the two countries. There are a lot of similarities. The main differences between two countries come in four, um, let's say, regarding four aspects. The first one concerns the most, most, uh, most probably the most obvious comes from the confidence in the government. If you see the down, down part of this uh, plot, you will see that in Russia, more than 50% of the population, they trust their government. While in Ukraine, around 22% only declared that they trust the government. The rest said they don't do it. The same, uh, uh, the same thing you can say also about feeling, uh, uh, let's say, about pride towards your uh, nation. In Russia, substantially more people declared that they uh, yeah, feel proud of their country. In Ukraine, so, uh, about 8% uh, percentage point uh, less uh, people could agree with this statement. And uh, third one, the third one is a democracy value. So if you ask people uh, what is, uh, how important democracy is a form of governance for your country, uh, more Ukrainians, substantially more Ukrainians, significantly more Ukrainians would say, yes, it is important than Russians. And the same about security. Ukrainians feel more secure than Russian, and it's interesting thing, regardless of uh, of the fact, fact that we don't have, we didn't have any army, and regardless of the fact that we didn't have any nuclear powers as Russians, and still they feel less secure than us. And I think the two of these positions are very important in explaining two things, in explaining the imperial identity that governs the Russian population, that the attachment to the state, increased attachment to the state measured through confidence in the government, and the measure of security, the feeling of insecurity as, uh, let's say, caused due to, um, uh, let's say, 
uh, uh, seeing or viewing West as a source of threat, as a source of threat for the country. And it's, uh, it's already in this data, right? In this descriptive analysis, we can see this difference in the contextual variables between the two countries. Now, I, oh, I'm sorry, I did something. So, <coughs> Um, now I would like to proceed to the empirical results. I use logistic regression. It's uh, possibly difficult to explain, but I put all variables together. I present them in their, uh, in parts, right? Because it's very difficult. Dispositional first, and we will start from that. If you took, took uh, if you check, there are two columns, how to interpret them. It's very easy. If you have a star, there is an effect of this variable, church attendance, on social, on the probability of trusting other people. Uh, the difference in, in the probability is 11.7%. So if I start attending church from, uh, if I change from never attending church to attending church, then my, the probability of trusting will, uh, um, here it's um, reverse skill, sorry. If I stop attending church on a weekly basis, to completely not going to the church, the probability of trusting will decrease by 11.7 percentage points. So it's very easy to interpret. If you see this for Ukraine, right, the dispositional factors were very important, right? As for Russia, but the interesting thing comes here, look, religiosity, religiosity church attendance. For Ukraine, the effect is positive because it goes from attending very often to never. For Russia, it's uh, negative. Orthodox. Both countries have very similar percentage of uh, Orthodox and prevalence of Orthodox in their population. But for Ukraine, the effect is negative. For Russia, it's positive. That's an interesting thing. The same, um, yeah. So uh, this, this difference exists also with regard to other variables. You can say from out of dispositional determinants, Ukraine was uh, social trust in Ukraine was built by religion, religiosity, by levels of nationalism, by health happiness levels, and by Ukrainian ethnic identity. Interestingly, people who felt Ukrainians in Ukraine, they had lower levels of trust than people who felt Russians in Ukraine. And it's given that level of trust is much higher in Ukraine than in Russia. So we can say that these people uh, who, let's say, belong to most probably Russian speaking minority or Russian killing minority, they were very well integrated into the society since they could uh, display such high levels of social, much higher than a native uh, population. In Russia, out of dispositional variables, we found that in addition to religiosity, religion, uh, health and happiness was important. But the most interesting part, the most interesting results pop up when we analyze the, the impact of contextual determinants. If you can see that in Ukraine, um, a lot of democracy-related variables impact the trust positively. So if people believe that democracy is important, uh, they would increase trust by eight percentage points. Uh, if people believe that their country is democratic, they would increase trust by 11 percentage points. Uh, in Russia, this was not the case at all. Democracy-related variables were not, um, let's say, in the, um, in the set of factors that would define the final level of trust. What defined final level is actually uh, these two main variables, feeling secure and confidence to the government. That I, I said to you before, the, uh, um, the two variables that could be a very crude measures of imperial visions that uh, Russian society is trying to promote uh, uh, through this uh, Mira, as they say. So people who trusted more to the government, they would have about 8% more, 8% um, per, uh, per percentage points more uh, to trust other individuals. And the people who feel secure inside society, they would also have substantially more uh, trust levels and higher trust levels than people who didn't do so. But in Ukraine, it's the same. It's security was also an important factor. You see, it's due to this conflict and everything. Uh, people who could feel secure would display much more trust than people who couldn't do that. And finally, if we introduce also a war variable, yeah, so I measure whether the responses come from the period 2011 
or they come from the last wave, 2020. You can see that due to, you would say, due to the conflict in the Eastern Ukraine, uh, the trust of individuals, the probability of trust in others increased by almost 11 percentage points. So uh, this conflict kind of followed, uh, let's say, in its impact, the classical explanation that uh, the conflict united the population against a common aggressor and boosted the creation of bonds among the individuals, in this particular case, measured through social trust levels. Now regions, if you see that there is a great variation of uh, original uh, differences in the levels of social trust in Ukraine, and society in Russia is very more homogeneous, and uh, it's, um, Russia doesn't, is not characterized by uh, great differences in social trust levels across, uh, across the population, uh, across different regions. I just, I, I will go quickly. I just put these results in one plot for you to see. And the main thing is here that the red dot, which represents Russia, is very far away in the uh, go away. At least you got me. Uh, the uh, red dot is very far from the blue dot, which represents in this particular case Ukraine. So the impact of the same variables, which we saw with you had the same values in descriptive statistics, is very different. Yeah, the same variables, the same aspirations that people have, the same evaluation that they give to their economy, democracy, I don't know what, they produce very different results in social trust. That's the most important that, that from this analysis you need to keep in your mind. Another thing, um, why would I include in the analysis two, uh, let's say two waves? I included the pre-war wave and war wave, 2020-2017. So the main thing is that there is a, um, uh, let's say a strand of studies, um, particularly focused on Ukraine, which uh, assured that uh, this conflict of 2014, it created uh, kind of uh, a break in the institutional development of Ukraine. The people started to reevaluate uh, their stand towards many political, let's say, um, political issues and uh, their stand towards uh, Russia, their stand towards the conflict, towards everything. And as such, what uh, the relationship that variables uh, showed before the conflict, they is, can be very different from the relationship between the same variables after the conflict. So to check whether it, this is the case, uh, for social trust, I just run uh, logistic regression for social trust, including the same variables, but differently for each year. And what you can see interesting from here, look, that before war, right, out of dispositional variables, before war, um, uh, let's say religion and religiosity was not important at all for social trust. But they became substantially more important after the war, after the uh, in the aftermath, let's say, of uh, of this conflict. I think it somehow can be explained that people in Ukraine stopped believing in the help, in the uh, uh, I don't know, in each other, and they turned to the goat uh, for protection. And also, war naturalized the effect of nationalism. It uh, strengthened the impact of health conditions, which is normal. That if people feel substantially, uh, feel or face more difficulties to find treatment and uh, find um, medicine when the uh, economy in war collapses due to inflation and everything. And it brought also the impact of uh, Ukrainian ethnic identity, which I showed you before, that people who tend to belong or declare to belong to Russian ethnos, they have higher levels of social trust compared to people who who declared to belong to Ukrainian ethnos. In Russia, look, there were a lot of variables like church attendance and health happiness uh, that shaped social, uh, social trust levels before the, before the conflict. In the aftermath of the conflict, they no longer played any, any role in social trust creation. What became important for Russia? It's only two variables, which relate directly to uh, to the uh, imperial visions of uh, Russia, Imper this uh, imperial identity, it's uh, democracy evaluation. Oh, sorry, <laughs> that's uh, confidence in the government, very strong impact, 10% increase and uh, feeling secure. But apart from that, some uh, democracy related variables were 
brought into their play. So people who believe that we need to choose leader in Russia through elections, and that uh, I see my country is democratic. They had also substantially higher levels of trust than other individuals, uh, or individuals who couldn't agree with these statements. And in Ukraine, political factors continue to play a substantial role. But right now, there are factors that define trust level. They um, had a direct connection with the scope of the war. So it is democracy especially democratic values, not the actual evaluation of democracy, but whether I consider democracy is important for me. That's what united the population in Ukraine and, and made them trust each other. If I believe that democracy is important, then I could trust other individuals. And also speaking Ukrainian, the people who started to speak Ukrainian, or at least identify themselves as Ukrainian language, they had also substantially high levels of social trust and people who couldn't uh, do so. So that's, uh, and uh, also interesting point that the conflict, of course, and the war is not a good thing, but it conducted some positive effect on the population of Ukraine. It made, uh, if you can see before war, there is a great uh, heterogeneity in uh, levels of social trust across regions. And this was no longer the case after the outbreak uh, of the conflict in the East. It, of course, it's possibly due to uh, in the internal displacement of individuals affected in the East, or it can be also due to this past break in the political visions and in economic situation and in general social uh, situation or conditions in the country. That's, I put uh, this, what I presented before, in, into graphs, right? And if you can see that there was a shift, you see it's Ukraine, 2011, red one, and uh, 2011 blue one, and 2020 red one. If you can see, it is a shift. In Russia, it was not the case so much, yeah, for some very good. But in Ukraine, there was a great shift in that. And now, I just, uh, conclusions, I already finished. First, I put some pictures, just not to make it so boring for you to a bit, uh, <laughs> yeah. So what's the main conclusions? We can draw from this analysis of, uh, with a lot of data and uh, very <laughs> difficult to interpret results. Uh, the, the first one, which, uh, sorry, I put immediately second, and I can go a second. Uh -huh. Here it's the first one. So if we remember, if we uh, take, um, if we analyze two data, right, data for all the periods, we would say that um, a lot of dispositional and contextual variables affect social trust levels in Ukraine and in Russia, right? But in Ukraine, in Ukraine, the level of trust is mostly defined through the contextual variables, which is a result of the experience with the context of the country. And in Russia, at least before, mostly before the conflict, it was a result of dispositional determinants, which uh, says that uh, trust in Russia was like a face face, which was inside internal characteristic, which was not influenced by, by the context or by the experience. The second one is that Ukraine definitely stands out in the impact of democracy-related uh, democracy related variables on social trust levels. So many more variables, whether I believe that my country is democratic, whether I want my country to be democratic, these uh, particular preferences and beliefs, they unite the population within the country and they make them trust each other. In Russia, it's not the case. In Russia, it's mostly their state, the attachment to the state and the issue of security. It defines how much I feel the member of my society, how much I trust other individuals and how much I, let's say, how much we are the single unity. And the third one, we saw this interesting thing, yeah, but in both countries, we have a lot of similarities. First, as Putin said, it's religion, and it's also a religiosity levels in language. And what we find out, that despite the fact that we had the same religion, the same language, the same, the same religiosity levels, right? And we found also that very similar values, these variables too, as I showed you in descriptive analysis, the impact of these variables, the role that these variables played in the creation of social trust was very different. In Ukraine, it was negative, uh, uh, in particular, to be orthodox, as it, it was found in other countries. In Russia, it was positive. Church attendance would be positive uh, determinant 
of social trust in Ukraine and negative determinant of social trust in Russia. Language, speaking Ukrainian would be positive determinant for Ukraine to uh, uh, in creating social trust and no effect in Russia. That's an interesting thing. We started from the same, the same level, right? From same uh, characteristic, but we ended very much in a different positions with regard how these particular features influence our society, especially influence the creation of secondary order cultural features such as social trust, for instance. This, the other one is the conflict, the impact of this conflict. In Ukraine, it conducted, as I said before, logically and according uh, to previous findings, it's conducted positive effect, united the population. In Russia, it didn't unite the population, most probably because it was promoted most um, at the beginning uh, by the governments. It was not so much internalized by the population. And uh, the last one is that um, significant differences existed between Ukraine and Russia. And they existed always, even before the conflict. And they were much deeper than everyone describes them, speaking the same language or religion. They, they existed. Uh, should, uh, yeah. The conflict only, um, let's say, increased uh, this divergence. And uh, I think that if someone would be able to collect more data on Ukraine after this war, it would be amazing results to show, you know, to compare are the three waves uh, before the conflict was 2014, in between period 2014-2022 and after that one. It would be uh, obvious how the uh, differences uh, could coexist, how these differences uh, started to change and in which particular point of time uh, they reached, let's say, uh, their maximum level. So what can I say from all this, what I uh, presented to you, uh, descriptive and uh, empirical results that, yeah, Two countries are different, two nations are different. Um, uh, if we speak the same language, we speak the same religion, we, we go to the church with the same frequency, it does not make, make us uh, the same people. And uh, this heterogeneity, which exists in between two nations, shouldn't be, uh, by theory, limited to only these three aspects, linguistic, uh, religion, or uh, religiosity. That there are many more aspects that should be for addressed by the research, which would show that two countries uh, are deeply different. And I just presented, I just described the statistic, I percentage of people who responded positively to their questions. I just want you to see, not to analyze it. For instance, uh, here it shows whether I can justify your morals of people, which is also part of culture. How I justify stealing from other people? How I justify uh, cheating on taxes? And you show the difference is huge between two countries, between two nations. Uh, how I can accept uh, being surveyed by the government? Uh, how, can, uh, been, uh, how can I accept uh, that the government um, collects information about me? A huge difference. So if you check this table, I can send you this presentation afterwards. You can put it and uh, give it more time. It's an amazing difference uh, in political values, economic, social, moral values between two countries. And what it says, it says very important things that, first of all, uh, uh, we can draw similarities between two nations, for instance, Germany and Austria, right? And between, for instance, uh, I don't know, England and India, by saying that, okay, possibly it's, the last one is not a perfect uh, example, that just because the nations speak the same language and have the same religion, they are the same. They are completely not the same. And this also shows that uh, we need to reconsider the theoretical foundations of uh, uh, th uh, theoretical approaches to defining culture. What it is culture? What dimensions exist in this culture? What plays among these dimensions, ling linguistic dimension and religious dimension take, and what the interactions between the, all these dimensions inside a very complex concept of culture. And I think that just to make you uh, laugh at this, that we definitely need to uh, insist on politicians taking part in life life lifelong learning to be in line with the most recent approaches to defining uh, or analyzing economy, society, and uh, politics in order to, you know, not to mislead their voters <laughs> or gain more voters <laughs> through their policies. So that's what basically said that, um, yeah, two countries are different. 
we define that they have similar religion and they have similar language and religiosity levels, but they conduct very different effect on social, on the secondary cultural phenomena such as social trust. And um, um, there are also a lot of differences between these two countries along many other dimensions, as I showed, political preferences, economic preferences, morals in general. And the question is why it happened should become most probably um, subject for, uh, for future research. It's, I just provide some explanations for direction for, uh, for let's say, analyzing this uh, particular issue. For instance, possibly because Ukraine was taking a secondary part in, uh, in this uh, union with Russia, in economically and politically, and possibly because Ukraine had the more positive experience with, during the transition and somehow affected their people positively by promoting support of Ukrainians uh, among the Ukrainians of democratic uh, reforms. It can be the case, but uh, more data are necessary and more theoretical approaches need to be employed in order to explain this in more details. And I thank you for the attention. And I think we need to invest more time in this particular aspect because there are so many countries which are trying to build their new state, newly born state and nation, their new nation. And this research could really help to understand how new countries can, uh, yeah, can make their process of state and nation building effective and or all countries can support, uh, preserve their nation and state in an effective way. So thank you very much for your attention.